We decided to do this because sommeliers really love competitions. So we sent the sommeliers out to try to find wines that are the future classics, that are the wines that really describe the place where they're being grown. The difference in, in soil, you can see right here. Seeing the people in their environment, suddenly you put something behind just a liquid. And this is the way I want to select the wine. I want to be able to share spirits and soul and history. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Happy to be here in uh, San Francisco. My name is Matthew Kaner from Covell in Los Angeles. What we have in this region, given its um, proximity, not only to um, northern influence from the Arctic winds, uh, it's closer to Toronto than it is to actually New York City. Think about proximity to cold weather. They deal with a lot of brutal winter influence. This next wine we're gonna tell you about, uh, it stood out in every context it possibly could have been thrown into. It's uh, from a limestone topsoil vineyard, which is very unique. Uh, the area itself, there's a lot of uh, beautiful waterfalls, all with exposed shale. Then you go up this hill, there's no sign, there's no one telling you that it's there. In fact, they probably don't want you there. But the Argetzinger Vineyard is this magical little uh, eastern exposure on the east side of Seneca um, that just the grapes, they look at the lake and they get happy every second. And I don't blame them. We went and stood there and it made sense why the wines show the way they do. And it's, it's fascinating because from this point on is typically a slightly higher ripening than that point going south. <laughs> oh, wow. and, you, and until you start picking it and saying, you know, one thing is you see these boxes coming in on the sorting table, box after box, and at some point you have to say, what is this? Why is this different? Uh, next in line is Herman J. Veemer. So we're at Ravines and Veemer, that's really, we're talking about 30 to 40 year old vines, which is extraordinarily old for this region. Um, this sits on the west side of Seneca, which is definitely the most planted, most populated, um, definitely the Napa of uh, the Finger Lakes. This is their home vineyard. It's shallow gravelly soils. They work with three different microclimates, and this one is three degrees colder than the other, and it's about a five minute drive away. Uh, you're basically where you sit in relation to the lake is in, it's insane all the different pockets and microclimates that you'll see. One good thing about Sideways is that there's been a lot of new plantings uh, since that movie, or since that time period at least. And we're seeing that these are, these are smaller parcels owned by individuals rather than, you know, say, 500 acre vineyards or 100 acre vineyards that are looking for a lot of bulk. Uh, uh, they're, they're really trying to express quality in these regions. And what we're seeing is individual expressions of terroir from each vineyard. And winemakers not feeling, they're feeling a little bit more involved as well in the process of expressing the terroir through winemaking and farming. Chardonnay thrives in Santa Barbara County. Uh, first and foremost, high luminosity. We kind of coined the term refrigerated sunshine early on. Uh, very, very cool growing region. Of course, there's two transverse mountain ranges, which sucks in a lot of cold air from the Pacific Ocean, <coughs> making it a very, very cold growing region with a lot of sunlight hours. So high luminosity, meaning high phenolic ripeness of skins um, at low potential alcohol. Wind is another factor, of course, that same kind of vacuum effect. As we were standing on the top of a lot of these vineyards, I mean, you can really feel the intense wind that's happening. And that, of course, shuts down the respiration of the grapevine, um, which helps to uh, definitely leave acidity levels a little bit higher. When the goal of the winemaker is to make a much more kind of linear, pristine version of Chardonnay, um, which has become a favorite, at least for us, it's a little bit easier out of this region. I think the biggest thing that, uh, that really ties the Santa Rita Hills together is acidity. There's high acid in all the wines, whether there's clay in the soil or, or limestone or diatomaceous earth or sand. Uh, there's acid. They have uh, enough cool weather and enough wind uh, that the grapes get ripe, but they never lose the acidity. This is my first time to Washington State. This was one of the most interesting and different wine countries I've ever seen. It is um, the big sky. In 1981, there were only 19, 19 wineries. In 2013, there's 800 plus. 
you don't have uh, pests or mildew or any mold or, or things like that. They don't have these problems. They're literally phylloxera free. In the summer, it can be 120 degrees during the day and 40 degrees at night, resulting in a natural high acidity in the wine. It was like a whirlpool of those mazulia floods coming through and bringing in all these pudding stones and these large, huge boulders that would come through. You'll see a lot of the wines that are from Red Mountain, small AVA, but extremely balanced in terms of this very dusty, low soil. Huge amount of accumulation of lows and this like fine-grained tannin. They have a lot of structure. They sometimes can have a lot of alcohol, but it has that restraint, those wines that show that elegant line throughout. Chris Peterson was the assistant winemaker under Chris Upchurch for about a decade. He said, and then Chris Upchurch said almost verbatim, I wait for the grapes to get just past underripe, and that's when I pick, which I don't know if any other place in this country can say that. And to see this sort of expression of a sense of place out of grapes that are just past underripe. I have put together a team of two kick-ass tasters from Houston. And we have decided to travel to the Anderson Valley together. Anderson Valley, from the very beginning, we're putting site first. You know, just as the ABA is sort of getting off their feet, there's people from outside who are coming and taking advantage of those single sites. From Navarro, through Philo to Boonville, so up north, where we call the deep end, closest to the ocean, uh, would be the coolest region. And a couple of our wines are from there, and a couple are scattered all the way around. Soil types were important to look at. Expositions, of course, elevation, uh, viticultural practices, vinification decisions, clonal selections as well came into play, and uh, finally, elevage, or choice of oak aging. So tasting the next wine, the 2011 Drew Family Wines Morning Dew Vineyard. Jason Drew and his wife Molly started in 2000 with Drew Cellars. Um, they make a number of wines from Mendocino Ridge to Redwood Valley to Anderson Valley, and they make four Pinots from Anderson Valley. We tasted the 12 and the 11 Morning Dew Ranch. 12 was great, but once we got to the 11, I was like, where have you been all of my life? The wine has this wash of red fruit, as all of his wines do. It's very typical of his style. And this hallmark acidity. We are team Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. We were very, very happy that Wine and Spirits put this together because it was a, an excuse for us to have fun. So we are off. Our first wine is uh, 2009 Stag's Leap District Cabernet Sauvignon from Robert Sinsky Vineyards. There were hunters chasing after a stag. They thought they cornered the stag by the foot of this 1,200 feet outcropping of basalt soil. Once they got him there, they thought they had him, but he jumped over it and he landed on the valley floor and ran away and survived. Thus comes the name Stag's Leap. The next wine is a 2011 Robert Mondavi Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve Tokalon. Tokalon is considered the first growth of Napa Valley. The soil type in Tokalon is gravelly loam, which also has very good drainage. It's on the valley floor, which sees a lot of sunlight, and you have grapes that are very ripe, juicy, silky. They drink immediately when they're young. They drink very well, but they really get better with age. So now we go to the mountains, to the region of Mount Vitor, with the Mayakamas 2008 Mount Vitor Cabernet Sauvignon. The name Mayakamas actually means uh, Howl of the Mountain Lion, which is a reference to the wildlife that's found in the area. Um, it was actually founded in 1889 by a pickle merchant, and then Bob Travers <laughs> took over in 1968 and started making real mountain-style wines. So the thing with uh, Spring Mountain is that you're at a higher elevation. 
Here in particular, Smith Madrone grows all of their Cabernet on this red rocky volcanic soil known as Aiken Loam. Um, so also, what's really interesting about it, and I feel like the only way to really experience it is to go up there, but you're in straight up nature. You're on these windy roads, and we finally get up there. There's no cell phone reception. We get lost on this trail, and basically we're just surrounded by these trees. There's Michael stepping in poison oak. Like, it's just a mess. And we found as a group that it's all of these different things, these elements, that almost creates the same thing that you would see in the southern Rome, like Greek. And basically what we found is a lot of these wines, Smith Madrone in particular, picks up these kind of herbal, almost evergreen qualities. We really discovered that there is terroir, amazing terroir in Napa Valley, from the valley floor to the bench to the mountains. And I hope you, you take time to really taste the wines because it is evident that ter uh, Napa Valley has fantastic terroir. Some of the most exciting wines I've tasted in California in a long time are coming specifically from Santa Rita Hills and from a couple of parcels in Santa Barbara County as well. Suddenly you understand how these lakes are so unique, what power, what natural power created them, and how because of that very specific layer of shell, we can really talk about terroir wine. I feel like the wines that we tasted wouldn't all fit into the austere category. And I think that's one misconception about Anderson Valley and Mendocino County. You know, I fell in love with Washington 10 years ago when I had Cadence 01 Ciel du Cheval, and I got to have it when we were up there. And it just, I just am so in love with this wines estate. I mean, I, I could so live there, it's so beautiful. The wines that I like was dying to drink. I wanted to drink so much of them. I wanted to eat food with them.